for the ACA Small Business Boot Camp for this Tuesday, March 22nd. We're excited to have everybody with us today. I'm Robert Theobald, the Small Business Ombudsman and Vice President of Small Business Services for the Arizona Commerce Authority. And I'd like to welcome you to, for joining us. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, the first thing I want to do today is I want to mention, um, if you notice my, my backgrounds that I like to use, if you've been with us on multiple uh, boot camps, is I like to change up the pictures for spots throughout Arizona. I want to do kind of a little public service announcement uh, uh, unofficially, but uh, we've got, uh, if you notice in the background, you got some green and some yellow. If you're an outdoors person right now is a great time to get outdoors into some of our great state parks, county parks, um, into the national forests and places. The spring wildflowers are blooming and uh, it's a small window that you get to see the, the gorgeous uh, nature that we have in our state. So I encourage everybody to enjoy the great weather, get out and uh, see the spring scenery while it's available. Um, so uh, take that time to enjoy our state. With that, I wanna go ahead and jump in and I wanna start by thanking all our community partners. We could not do these boot camp sessions without our community partners, their time, their effort and their expertise. So for those new to the Small Business Boot Camp, it is a webinar series designed to help small businesses uh, prepare, plan, and grow as we move forward. It is a statewide initiative supported by all of our community partners, and our community partners come from all over the state, from, from all corners of the state. Um, and not only is it a Tuesday morning webinar uh, that we do every Tuesday morning at 9 a.m., it is also a content library, and we've added for 2022 access to workshop series with our community partners. So we'll dive into that. We'll all share some information about the workshops that are coming up. But let's talk about the content library because that's an awesome little piece. So on our website, you can find at the bottom of the web page, uh, the bootcamp web page, our content library. And you can see on the little phone icon there that there's seven different uh, categories that you can sort our webinars through. Now we started recording our webinars from the very first bootcamp webinar back in April of 2020. And we have over 200 recorded webinar presentations that from our community partners, from our experts, that you can go on and access at any time, review the webinar and the materials. Uh, we, we upload the slide, the slide decks and any other materials that our community partners provide. And so those are, again, are available to you on our content library. It's a great resource, there's no cost. You can share the links with others too. Um, so if you know, if you know a small business owner that uh, is in need of some of this help, uh, feel free to send them to that page and they can identify the content that will help them out best. Um, so it is an uh, amazing resource that, that has come to fruition after nearly two years of doing bootcamp sessions. Also, I wanna talk about some of the ACA programs that we have to support small businesses. We have our small business services, our workforce division, and our Arizona MEP, our manufacturing extension partnership. All, all three divisions are there to help support small businesses uh, in their different areas and help them grow. Additionally, for those looking to start a business or expand your business into new areas, we have our small business checklist. And this is designed to help, it's an online interactive tool designed to help small business owners or entrepreneurs identify the commonly requested licensing, registration, and compliance needs at the local, state, and federal level. You can also find additional information on there on business planning, procurement, marketing, and other business categories. As you notice on the screen on the little right hand, bottom right hand uh, corner of the screen on the web page or on the slide deck there, you can see Sally, our virtual assistant. Sally is our is there to help us uh, quickly identify some of the basic things of the checklist, but first highly detailed information, you can take the deep dive into the checklist and get the, a lot of detailed information. So please check that out. With that, we wanna to transition to some small business updates. Um, we're gonna post links for all this information in the chat. Uh, so you can click on that um, and open those pages or refer to it. But uh, we're gonna send some information. The SBA um, extended the EIDL program deferment period. So if you got an economic injury disaster loan, um, there was a period in which was the payments were being deferred 
Um, because of COVID and the SBA extended that deferment period, you can find more information on the link we'll post, um, which is the press release from the SBA. Also, our Small Business Digital Academy uh, that is designed to help small businesses grow and improve their online presence is currently open for applications. So if you are looking for a, a digital, uh, you know, helping with social media or your website, kind of a one-on-one level class, this is a six-week long cohort style program where we do um, the class sessions every Monday um, with there is homework is a part of that program during the week. Um, it's about a four to six hour commitment per week for six weeks for this program. But if it's something you're interested in, you can go onto the website and read more information about it and, and submit your application. We will post the link for that in the chat. And I just found out today the Dream Big Awards, this is by the US Chamber of Commerce, is accepting applications uh, for this program. It's a, an awards um, program for small businesses. And there's also some financial awards for all the people that apply for the big awards. So there's a number of different things. So with your business, it may be something you want to apply for. Uh, please check that out. And then small business taxes are coming up. We're going to post a link for the FAQs for the IRS's website. They have a lot of great information for small business owners related to taxes. And as we're in tax season, we want to make sure that uh, everybody can get their taxes done and submitted on time. One of the things that we found over the last two years with many of the grants and loan programs is that a lot of small business owners, their taxes weren't, um, they were deferred or, you know, they got extensions on them. And so a lot of their tax stuff wasn't together um, and it made it difficult to apply for some of the programs. So uh, I want to make sure we share some of this information to you so we can stay on top of that. So with that, we're gonna look at some of our upcoming sessions. So next Tuesday, March 29th, we're gonna have leveraging influencer marketing to drive business results. We're real excited about this. This is a new topic uh, that we're touching on. We've got a new presenter, uh, so please join us for that. Um, uh, there's a lot of interesting information when it comes to using influencer marketing at various different levels to help grow your business. Um, and then on Thursday, March, 31st, we have a one of our workshops. Our small business bootcamp workshop series is doing a business tax basics, transaction privilege tax. This is by the training and education experts that are part of the Department of Revenue. Um, and they, they focus on helping teach people about uh, state taxes. And so they are coming on to, to share with us information about TPT, transaction privilege tax or sales tax, and how to be compliant deadlines and so forth on that. Again, to help small businesses, you're approaching the end of tax season. And then on Tuesday, April 5th, we've got our Foundations of Marketing. We've got a great new presenter. Really excited to have her with us on that. Um, and so she's got a lot of really cool and interesting uh, ideas to share with you. So uh, please join us for that session. Um, as we jump into today's session, we have Tom Argero. Uh, from the North Phoenix Chamber, he is going to be presenting on the business model canvas. And Tom has done with us this with us before. It's a great, uh, great presentation. He's added and updated some things. But the next probably six boot camp sessions after today, I'll build on some things that you that you can do better if you've done a business model canvas ahead of time. And so this is kind of a, a building block for some of the upcoming sessions to help make those uh, follow-up sessions even more productive. Um, they'll be productive on their own, but if you do a business model canvas ahead of time, you can even take it to the next level. <clears throat> and I encourage everybody to make sure you have a pen and paper handy. So as you go through some of this presentation with Tom, you can take notes or actually do some of the exercises that he talks about. Um, while he's doing it because it's a, a simple process, but it's an amazing process for your business. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn the time over to Tom, stop sharing my screen. And then Tom, it is all yours. Super, thank you so much, Robert. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I think this is the third time now that I've uh, run through this business model canvas for, why is that not, come on, I said begin. There we go. 
Uh, this is, I think, the third time that I've run through the business model canvas for this uh, boot camp series in the past two years. So I really appreciate the opportunity uh, from all of you to, to be able to present this. To keep it from being boring, because I saw already somebody in the chat window said that she's already been through this uh, process uh, and she's here again, I wanted to have some bonus material near the end of the, the presentation. So uh, last year uh, in January of 2021, Robert asked me when I pitched, uh, presented the business model canvas the last time, since it was the beginning of the year, it was a good time to talk about some goal setting. And I focused a lot on uh, marketing channels and a lot of the marketing related content. And you'll, you'll see how that fits within the canvas today. Today, I took a, a step into the back office and at part of the bonus you're going to hear from me today is around, um, around the activities that you need on a, on a regular basis to run your business. And we'll cover that here as I get through this. So if you're not familiar with the business model canvas, the intent of this is to take most of the things that you would have on a, on a full-blown business plan and stick it on one page. And this becomes a bit of an executive summary, I guess, is probably the best way to think of it. Uh, it becomes a template or an, of, uh, toward a full-blown biz, uh, business plan without going through the full exercise of developing a business plan yet. Um, so this is, it's a very short, quick exercise. Once you're familiar with this process and you get through today's hour and you spend an hour on your own, roughly, you can flush out a lot of these uh, a lot of the content in these boxes on your own in about an hour's worth of work. Uh, you'll get faster at it the more of these you do if you have any opportunity to, to execute more than one business model canvas at a time uh, over time. So I'm gonna jump right in. These are nine boxes that are um, all related and connected and interconnected to each other is they're configured on here in a very specific pattern. And these numbers and these arrows are gonna be confusing as the Dickens to you for the next 15 minutes. And by the time I get through walking through this process, uh, it'll all be, it'll all make perfect sense. So what are the arrows that I have over on the right side of the screen are all about the customer facing front half of uh, your business. Uh, we'll, we'll cover these boxes in the sequence and it's an odd order at first, but as soon as you see the sequence, it'll make perfect sense. We're going to start all over on the far right for the customer segment, for example, and circle around on that side. Then we're going to pop over to the to the left side and circle through those boxes uh, as the second half of understanding your your business. So the very first box over on the far right helps you define your is, is designed to help you define your customer segment. Who is your ideal client? Who are you trying to reach with whatever the business is that you are running? Uh, becomes the first question. And the company strategizer that has put together this business model canvas, I think they are one of the first, uh, one of the original creators of that canvas, as near as I can tell, probably a dozen years now uh, since they first developed this. There are lots of other canvases. You'll find lean canvases, you'll find mark canvases. There are millions of them out there, or at least a thousand of them now. Uh, but strategizer developed the original business model canvas. There's a tool that SBDC uses in particular called a growth wheel. And I happen to like one component of that growth wheel in particular that I use here at this section where I'm helping define my customer segment or helping somebody define theirs. Uh, and it, it, this is a good place to interject a second tool, I think. There's a persona worksheet within the growth wheel. And I have a copy of that up on my screen that helps you think more about your ideal client in terms of what are they doing with their head? What are they thinking? What ideas, assumptions, opinions do they have about the product or the service and the industry that you're in? Not necessarily about your company because they may not know who you are yet if you're a startup, for instance. You know, they may have some perceptions about personal lines of insurance, as an example. Um, what are their ideas, their assumptions, their opinions about insurance? What are they thinking? What do they feel about it with their heart is the second section over here on the far right. Um, what are their concerns, their interests, their preferences, things that are on their heart about the product or service that you're, you're developing? 
what are they doing with their hands? You know, what are they responsible for on a daily basis? What are the projects that they execute uh, through? Uh, what are their daily activities, weekly activities using, in this example I threw out there a second ago, insurance um, as a consumer? And then where are they going with their feet? Where are their feet taking them? What direction are they heading? What changes are they about to face? What opportunities are ahead of them? And it's gonna be different for each type of customer, depending on the product and the service that you're offering. There's some other boxes here at the bottom of the screen to help you understand and flush out some challenges, their needs, the circumstances they're in, et cetera. Uh, but all of that helps you identify, I think, a pretty clear picture of who your ideal client is. What's going on in their head, their heart, what are they doing with their hands? Where are they heading with their feet? Once you understand who your ideal client is, and that really has to be the first step, and that's why we start so far over on that right side, is because the very next step, this bridge in the middle of the entire canvas, is your value proposition. What are you doing with your particular new business idea that helps address the things that your ideal client is thinking about? What are they feeling? What are they doing? Where are they going? Are you providing pain relievers or gain makers to help them address those concerns? And this is where you start to flush out your marketing messages as well, as you think about your value proposition. You know, what are you doing unique to other, compared to others in the industry that you're in, for instance? Um, those are the kinds of questions you wanna ask yourself about your value prop. But it really has to be related to flushing out your marketing message and your, your offering to your ideal client. So that's what the value prop box is for. The third box uh, channels, and that's that bridge between your value proposition and your customer segment. And it flows from left to right, from your value prop to your customer segment. The channels are the places where your ideal client can be reached. Where do they hang out? On social media, they have cell phones, they receive text messages, they can receive emails, they attend meetings and events, and there's places to interact with them face-to-face. -face. And this, the channels are all of the ways that you uh, communicate, all, the, all the, <laughs> the places you communicate with your clients or potential clients. These are, um, these are prospects at this point or even leads. They don't even know you're there uh, yet. And that's why this third bullet talks about awareness and evaluation before going through the rest of the life cycle of the sales process. Your ideal client has to become aware of you first and your marketing channels, YouTube videos, your website, all those places where uh, they find you or discover that you exist is where they become aware of you. And that's what the channels are for. The fourth box right above channels then are flowing the other direction. So your marketing is all about just dragging a lure through the water with your fishing reel and, uh, and, and just having your lure out there fluffing along. The, the moment that a prospect or the, the moment that a potential customer twitches and reacts to your lure, they begin to interact with you. And that's, you can start the sales process a little bit further down the path. Uh, it's not just about marketing. You start to transition now into your, into your education and um, inf information delivery as part of the sales process. And that's what this fourth box is for. It's the relationship that you begin to establish with individuals, with individual potential customers, with your existing customers, et cetera. So this customer relations box uh, typically flows both ways again between the value prop and the customer, but it's much more customer centric at this point, uh, taking the initiative, reaching out to you and reacting to your marketing material that you presented in box number three, the channels right below this. I hope that's about as clear as mud. Uh, those four boxes, if you get those well, executed and you think through all those very well, eventually money flows into your business. Your customers will eventually purchase from you. And that's what the revenue stream, then the fifth box on the bottom right is for. 
This is where you start to document the way that you receive payments, the way your customers pay you, um, you know, are you cash, are you credit? Um, do you have monthly subscriptions? Do they pay one-time use? All sorts of ways to uh, monetize a business. And this is where you document those revenue streams. There are some interesting models, different ways to run businesses. Um, nonprofits come to mind, for instance. Uh, I'm actually helping somebody through in the, uh, her first run at the election process. She's running for a city council office. And she, her constituents, the people that she's really delivering most of her value prop to, that she's encouraging to vote for her are not the, the funding source. She has donors separate in a campaign, for instance, than the people who are voting for her. Uh, so her revenue stream is, is separated out and, and thought of differently than from the consumer. And if, if she was thinking of her campaign as a business. So a lot of times you'll find, you know, you offer something, you know, the world can use whatever you're doing for free, but somebody's paying for it on the back end. You're generating revenue from advertising or, you know, sponsorships or, you know, some other alternative funding um, becomes a revenue stream, but it's maybe separated from who your customers are in, in some types of, of businesses. So that's, it's been a fun process to work through with her and understand how that differs sometimes. But this is the place where you think about what are your customers currently paying? How are they currently paying for whatever the service or product is that you're, you're providing? And whether or not you are trying to disrupt that and, and break a pattern. The example that I like to use here on, on, on that particular concept is uh, Netflix. Now, let's say you're coming up with some kind of an idea. You've got a, you've got a bright idea to start a business that's going to be uh, providing video services, movies on demand. But every time you want somebody to watch a movie, they have to come to you personally and they have to pay you cash in order to watch a movie. Our, our current behavior in terms of streaming video is we set up a recurring payment. We don't think about the payment while we're sitting in our living room on a Tuesday night consuming a movie on Netflix or wherever our streaming video is coming from. Uh, so if you were to ask people to break their mindset and behavior of a monthly subscription for something like a video service, you're gonna be up against a, a, a very disruptive pattern, right? It's gonna be difficult to pull that off. Um, so I hope that makes sense. Um, we'll have some Q and A section here at the end of this and we can discuss this if, if this whole revenue stream piece is confusing. So everything that we've done up to this point on the right side of the canvas is all the customer facing stuff. I'm going to back up a couple slides because I don't think I have this in any other place coming up. So everything we've covered on the right side of the screen is customer facing. And if you take a look at that value proposition in the center, it's basically a bridge between the whole canvas. I like to think of that value proposition box as a stage. The curtain is on the right side of the stage. It's facing the customers. And whatever production you're putting on on that stage in your value proposition, you're delivering to the audience that's sitting out there. You're interacting with your audience. They had to come through the ticket counter in order to purchase a ticket and have a seat at the table or in your theater. Everything to the left of the value proposition, boxes six, seven, eight, and nine, are behind the stage. There's, think of a wall on the left side of your value prop, and everything going on back there is your back office operations. It's everything you need to be able to execute everything we've talked about so far on the customer facing front side of the stage. Uh, so we're gonna dive a little bit now into these boxes, six, seven, eight, and nine, and describe what the back office operations look like. So let me jump up here to box number six is where you start to define uh, the resources that you need in order to deliver your value proposition and how do you manage the channels. Uh, 
your social media accounts. And you've got a Facebook account, you have a Twitter account, you have a TikTok, you've got a LinkedIn account, you have a website, you have a Google My Business page, hopefully, you have a presence at a local chamber of commerce, hopefully, and maybe a BNI chapter you belong to. You have a handful of resources um, that you're juggling and managing to deliver your value message to your potential customers through the channels. You also have human resources. You know, there are there are people involved in running your business. You are you you're one of the humans. You might have other staff. You may have a telephone system that's physical. Uh, you may have a building or a warehouse that's part of your physical resources that you need. You have financial resources that you need. You have to have a business checking account. You have to have some way to receive payments through credit processing, a square account, for instance, if you're a small business and getting started. Uh, so you've got many types of resources, key resources that you need to have in place in order to run your business. And this is the box where you flush that out and, and document what you need in terms of, of resources. All of those resources require some activity, and that's box number seven. How are you using a resource on a daily or a weekly or monthly basis to deliver your marketing material, to communicate with customers, to onboard a new customer, to provide customer service if there's a, if there's a, a problem or a complaint? Um, all of your financial activities, you're taking payments, you're paying bills, you're paying your employees, you're paying your lease. You know, there's a ton of activities around running a business, uh, daily, weekly, monthly operations. So the types of activities you want to flush out are what are you doing to produce your value? What problems are you solving on a regular basis or irregular? It can happen. Um, and what kind of maintenance are you doing system-wide to keep your business running and functioning? Those are some ideas on the types of uh, key activities that it takes to run a business. All of those resources and all that activity comes with a cost. So the eighth box in the canvas is where we document our cost structure. You, you have regular bills you need to pay. <laughs> and that's, that's basically what your cost structures include. Um, what are the most important core costs? Uh, what are your most expensive key resources? What are some of the activities that cost the most? Could be in terms of time as well. By the way, it's not monetary. Um, you know, where, are you, where are you gonna spend the most amount of time and energy um, to execute your plan? You want to document things that are fixed costs, like your monthly lease. You have variable costs. You know, it's five dollars for every new customer you bring on board, etc. Uh, the real key, <laughs> the real question that you're trying to flush out here is, what does the balance sheet look like? Are you going to generate enough additional revenue to cover your costs, including paying yourself? And that's a basic question that this whole business model canvas should be helping you flush out. The, the two boxes on the bottom, the cost structure on the left and the revenue stream on the right are taking up an equal amount of space. But think about moving that line left and right uh, between the two in terms of balance. So if you have more revenue coming in than you have costs, that line moves a little bit over to the left and you've got a bigger percentage of revenue, right? If you've got a high expense side and you don't have a whole lot of revenue to cover it, that you're off balance and you've got to at least cover your expenses. That's why those are split kind of as a 50-50 at the bottom of the screen. The last box uh, is designed to help us realize we don't run a business in a vacuum. None of us do. You might be in business by yourself, but you're not alone is what I like to say here at uh, the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, you have suppliers that are needed. You have other relationships that are necessary. You have other activities that you're deferring or offloading and having other people execute for you. Those all require partnerships and relationships that you need to manage. Think of that as the loading dock on the far left side of your business. 
canvas. This is the back office and that's the extension outside your, your back door where you're bringing in other resources. Those are your key partners. You wanna give some consideration here to uh, how efficient that is. I mean, what are the things that you can do well yourself? What are your weaknesses that you need to hire for? And maybe you're contracting out for, so it's not necessarily a human resource or a key resource and key activity may not be a person that you've hired. It could be uh, something you've contracted or, or hired as a service out the back door. Keep in mind though, that there is some, some risk with that uh, in terms of, I don't think about supply chain. Where are we now? What's the conversation been for a year around supply chain issues? So many businesses have not thought about redundancy and having multiple supply partners or, or regions of the world where their supplies are coming from, right? And some of that might've been mitigated possibly, who knows? Uh, if people would have thought a little bit further through that key partner side and supply chain and redundancy and risk management and all of that, you may have a more expensive supplier somewhere else in the world, but you need to test it occasionally and, and buy something from somebody else occasionally and test how that flows and keep a relationship open four times when things break. So Enough on key partnerships, I think. I'm going to move on. Once you have flushed out all of that, once you've defined all of those things on the box, in, in the nine boxes on the page, you've invested about an hour maybe to, to do a massive brain dump. And at that point, you need to push yourself away from your desk. And you need to step, step out, climb out of your chair, go through the door, go step outside and go talk to people and test your assumptions. You have just made probably a ton of assumptions on this canvas, uh, on your business model canvas. You assumed customers would pay what you're needing to charge. You assume that your value proposition is gonna resonate with them. You assume that uh, you've identified the of where you can reach your ideal client. If you missed any of those three questions that I just raised, and there's a whole bunch more, but if you missed any of those three, your business is not going to get off the ground particularly well. So you need to go talk to humans. There's actually a book written called Talk to Humans, and it's all about how do you test the assumptions that you've made in your business model canvas as you dumped all these ideas down on paper. Uh, you need to test some of the most critical things. Does your value proposition really address their needs? And I've got four bullet points here. Will your customers pay for this? Um, can you build it and deliver it? There's another issue, right? Uh, you may have designed the, the coolest widget in the world, but you can't figure out how to build it or how to get it in your customer's hands. Uh, and are you asking your customer to consume your service differently than they're accustomed to? And that's the Netflix example, the streaming video example I gave a little while ago. Uh, one of the cartoons that's in this in this book, Talking to Humans, um, I love this. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a software developer as well as the chamber exec here at North Phoenix Chamber. And uh, this just resonates so well with me. Um, if I was building an application, you know, this first guy says, if I were our teenage girl target, I would love our new product. You know, I'm, you know, he's designed something, probably software. The other guy says, have you actually talked to anyone to make sure? And the third, third nerd says, why should I, why should I even leave the room? What are you talking about? Um, we do this in a vacuum. We're going to make something and hopefully our target loves it, right? We think we understand. You don't understand. I, I can tell you there's a decent chance that uh, your customers have a different perspective than you think they have. So, uh, and that's just general. That's typical human nature. We get so locked into what we think is the coolest shiny object. and it doesn't fit what the consumer is looking for. We see it daily. Uh, so test your assumptions. That's, that's one of the next things you do after designing your canvas. I'm gonna stop and take a deep breath and a sip of water because I'm gonna move into some bonus material now. Every, if you've been through this before and you've seen my presentation before, you've seen everything up to this point. And I've got some new content coming here on the next slide.
So last year, um, part of the bonus material that I provided, if you go back to the archives and you find uh, the video from the recording from last January, um, I spent a lot of time on the marketing channel side, and the channels and the marketing message side, and laid out a strategy for setting weekly goals uh, for a 12-week process. So for an entire quarter, um, basically defining your ideal week and then repeating that week 12 times. That's one way of getting through your marketing process, um, assuming you have everything about your, your canvas laid out correctly. Today, I'm going to focus on box number seven, which is the key activities and thinking about the repeatable processes that you need in order to run your business. You have things that you're going to be doing on a daily basis and a weekly basis, interacting with your marketing material, with your sales presentations, running your operations, your finances, et cetera. So you, if you start to think about those key activities yeah, in two ways, I actually have one here. Um, by department, you know, we all wear 17 hats as business owners. And there are, I think, six main departments in, a, in any business, different hats that you need to be wearing. Within your marketing, you're doing something every day, like social media posting. Maybe once a week or once a month, you're producing a newsletter. You know, finances, quarterly, you're, you're filing quarterly taxes. But you've got something daily of collecting payments from your clients, hopefully daily. Uh, you have some weekly financing, maybe reporting and getting things to your, to your bookkeeper, uh, certainly on a monthly basis. Um, so you have daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly, and annual time frame activities for each of these departments. By taking the time to document all of those activities that are gonna be in your box number seven and really expanding out that key activity box to the point of having checklists and procedures written down so that you can cross train new employees. There's reasons to do this. I'm not actually gonna come back to this slide. Um, you can use this to onboard new employees. You can use it to cross train your existing team. You can use it to discover things that are broken and processes that you can uh, streamline and workflows that you can improve. Um, most of us start a business, hopefully thinking about a final exit of being, you know, having millions of dollars and driving a Ferrari and getting out of the business that we created. Um, if we've left corporate and we jump into a business, uh, we've basically created a job for ourselves. It's true for most of us. Um, and you're now working your butt off more than the 40 hours a week that your employer had you working and you're, you're treading, right? So the goal is to find a way to eventually exit. And one of the ways to eventually sell out the business or, or have someone else run it on a daily basis is to have everything so well documented that it's repeatable and, and others know how to do what you're doing. You can step back and have a higher vision and, and keep that going as opposed to down in the trenches. So I'm going to back up a couple slides here. I just uh, dove pretty deeply into that. So if you document what you're doing uh, for every step, you know, you've got daily marketing activities, you have weekly activities for marketing and sales and finance, et cetera. If you have a piece of paper for each of those steps, for each of those processes, let's say, and you do this strictly on paper initially, uh, one or two sheets of paper should be able to cover, let's say, how do you do a social media post and really break that down. Now you need to log into your account. What are the key resources you need? You need a Facebook account to be able to do this. You need to be able to log into the account. That's how you prepare to, to make a social media post. Now, how do you perform any of the steps leading up to that, um, you've been friending people and sending out requests and all that sort of stuff. What steps are you taking now with this resource while well, you're typing in a post and you're getting ready to hit submit, for example? Um, and what other resources do you need to perform <coughs> to perform that particular activity? So you literally document um, everything in your business. And these are called standard operating procedures but I don't like to call them standard operating procedures because that is such a boring title that, that just feels, uh, <laughs> an SOP just feels like, uh, 
I don't even know how to, how to say it. Uh, you print it out, it collects dust, you stick it on a shelf, you forget about it. That's what SOPs are for. They become giant paperweights holding up a shelf or holding, weighing down a shelf. Instead, I like to reframe the concept of a, of a standard operating procedure, and I like to call these playbooks. It's a checklist that you're going to pull out every single time you produce your weekly newsletter, for instance. And you're going to run through the checklist and make sure that you've uh, captured all the points that are, that are necessary. You know, what's the overview? Why are you doing this? Um, what do you have to have in, in front of you before you start to put together your weekly newsletter, for instance? Let's use that as an example. What tools do you have to have started up? What uh, content are you starting to pull together? What do you need to write originally, uh, new original content? <laughs> Maybe you have some blog posts that you're going to repurpose or some video you're going to you know, repurpose and send out for the week. So what resources are needed to perform this task? And then you're going to capture screenshots, capture video, bring all this together into one place, into one document, links to other documents if you're doing this online. You want to organize the entire workflow and say, you know, step one, step two, step three, this is how we produce our newsletter on a weekly basis. Uh, I have a template. If you, if you want to see this, I'll have my contact information on the last slide. Uh, I have a template that I've used for our Chambers playbook that I'll share with you uh, for all of you listening to this today. And uh, just having a consistent format, consistent way of documenting the work in your business is such a critical step to help you uh, for many reasons. And I covered it here for onboarding new employees, for cross-training, uh, for discovering things that are broken and eventually being able to exit your business. So once you have a workflow, let's say the weekly newsletter, and we've used this as an example within our chamber with, for a couple of years now, we've been doing this. I'm gonna run through that checklist myself as I produce the weekly newsletter, and I'm gonna fine tune it and make sure I have any steps, but I'm gonna have that checklist in front of me every single time I produce the weekly newsletter. I wanna make sure my screenshots are there, everything is as accurate as I can get documented. My board chairman uh, asked me about six months ago if he could take the newsletter off of my plate and relieve me of some work so that I could focus a little bit more on, uh, on the sales and the development of the chamber. Sure, here's the run book. <laughs> here's my playbook uh, for producing a weekly newsletter. Justin, go, go do this. And he came right back with a bunch of questions, right? There were things that I was making, I had to test my assumptions. And this was a great way to see there were things that I was doing that I didn't have documented that I just glossed right over. Every time he asked a question or wasn't clear about something, we updated the playbook for the weekly newsletter. He ran through it for two or three, four weeks in a row, had it pretty well fine-tuned, he thought. We passed it on to, to somebody else and let them run the newsletter every week for about a month and flush out their questions. And, and improve the documentation even better. Eventually you end up with a pretty solid <laughs> document um, for how to do one thing like the weekly newsletter. And that's included in our playbook collection of, we're doing all this basically on a shared Google Drive. So we have one document for each process within the, within the organization. There's a whole collection of processes that are needed for marketing and a whole collection needed for sales and for operations, et cetera. But um, that's it for my bonus material. I really wanted to cover um, really expanding out that key activity box and, and really thinking about how you document. This is much further down the path, by the way. You've just designed your business model canvas. You've gone and tested uh, for... Um, tested your assumptions, right? You flushed out the business, you're up and running and you're, you've been running for a while. This is where you start to focus on really cleaning up that next step, the key activities that you're performing and others in your company are performing. Um, and that's really what this is for. So I think the last slide is my contact information. There you go right there. Um, so as, as Robert introduced me earlier, I am the executive director at the North Phoenix Chamber. There's my contact information. Um, I'm also a software developer, contact information down below. Uh, Robert, I'm gonna, I see you just came off of uh, 
visual mute. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I don't know if we have time for questions or how we you do. want to we do field have some that. Time for some questions. So let's say uh, to all of our attendees, please uh, post any questions you have about the business model canvas, any of the sections of it uh, in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and we can ask Tom. Um, one of the things, you know, I want to share why I was talking to Tom about this is we like to use the business model canvas with a lot of our programs because it helps businesses identify, you know, when you at the very, very beginning, who your target market is, who your target audience is, what's your value uh, proposition. So, um, Tom, what's an easy way, you know, can you go back through when you're looking at these small business owners um, that are participating here? What is a product, you know, something they can do to help identify their potential clients, you know, their target audience. They may have their main target audience, but to look at other potential target audiences sure. um, or their, their product or services. Yeah, let me go back to that slide, if that's helpful. Yeah. Someone asked for my contact information in the chat window as well. I just reposted uh, information off of this screen. So back near the very front of this, and I'm sorry, can you ask the question again around the customer? It was around your target audience. Yeah. So, you know, everybody has their initial target audience, you know, mm -hmm. ideal customer. What are some other things you can do to help identify um, other potential target seg or customer segments? Mm hmm. It's a good question. Um, another section here that I didn't really touch on is around um, the demographics of your of your ideal client, their age, their gender, education, etc. Industries um, would you know what what is maybe a normal industry that they're in? When you think about industries, you know maybe somebody's in the financial sector. Maybe someone's specifically, maybe you've got a product or a service you're providing specifically to, let's say, insurance agents. But insurance is really part of the financial sector, and there might be a secondary market in others related to insurance in the financial sector, like financial advisors, mortgage lenders, et cetera. So maybe just even branching, just starting out by branching out to other industries within, your, within the sector of your ideal client might be helpful. Um, as you start to uncover, let's say, the challenges that they're facing or their needs, it might become really obvious that there are others that face the same challenge. Maybe you need to start asking that question. You know, who else is facing this challenge? Who else is in this circumstance? Who else is heading in this direction or performing these activities? besides the individual that you thought you were originally identifying. Um, so I guess I would, I would start out by asking, at least for these dozen boxes, if not everything else on this page, who else is in this situation? And that's going to open, I think, as you have to talk to your ideal client, you're going to find out who their customers are, possibly, and uh, maybe you can do something to help them address their customers' needs better okay. than, right? There's another angle there. I don't know if that now, answers the question. Is, yeah, and, and as, uh, I want to note again on this page that you've got up, mm -hmm. this is the um, growth wheel mm -hmm. um, decision sheet for the ideal client yes. persona. Um, we can't post this separately to the licensing stuff, Good. We're going to, you can see this in Tom's presentation. We'll post Tom's presentation. However, you can work with the small business development centers or no cost program. If they can help get you access to this page um, and walk you through the growth wheel and some other tools that they have, including the business model canvas. Yep. And the growth wheel um, is a fantastic a question, tool. Yeah. yeah. We have the question, where can I find the business model canvas? Uh, there are about a thousand of them out there. If you go Googling for it, you're going to find lots of variations of it. I have one in particular. If you shoot me an email, um, I'll send you back one that, um, that I used in this presentation. The one that I have up here on the upper left corner of this screen. My reading glasses are not good enough to see the marching ants in each box. 
so I've actually just taken a, a, a single document and created a table that has this layout as well. So I've got a blank version of this and I have this from Strategizer. Actually, I would suggest going to strategizer.com. Let me pop that in the text in the chat window because it's not easy to spell, at least off the top of my head. Strat strategizer.com. Uh, the fine folks there are the ones that actually invented this canvas. So strategizer.com is uh, where you would go find, go get the original. Um, shoot me an email and I can get you a copy of it as well. It's a PDF, I think. So. Yeah, and I, I just pulled up their website and if you go to strategizer.com, they have a link right there to download their uh, business model canvas. Mm -hmm. um, they also have some other tools on there that you can download. Yes. Um, so, yep. They have a whole separate worksheet for flushing out your value prop and your ideal client. Um, they use a different process than what I've grabbed here from the growth wheel. So, a different exercise, but worth going through as well. Excellent. Do we have any other questions for Tom and for the business model camps? Um, again, this is the, the third time Tom's presented. We've actually had another presenter talk on this. The, the business model canvas, one of the reasons why I like to have it on a couple times a year, actually, on our, on our boot camp series, is this is an activity you should do more than once a year. Yes. It's not a one and done. It's definitely a live living document um, that uh, you should be constantly updating, adjusting, tweaking. Um, so please keep that in mind. Um, that's why I like to do it because again, Tom brought new ideas with us, new, new training on it. We could spend a whole day talking about it in detail. Mm -hmm. um, but a great session. And I liked the, the bonus material that Tom brought this time, uh, great information. So with that, I don't see any more questions. Um, I do want to just share one more, one more yes, quick absolutely. note. A lot, of the, a lot of times I will have somebody ask me, uh, what's the difference between this and a business plan? And can I use the business model canvas and, and go walk into a bank and get a loan? And the answer typically is no. Um, this is not enough detail uh, to have yourself positioned in a place that a bank is going to trust what you're, what, where you're heading. Uh, you've only got one piece of paper and you've, you've got a very high level summary of what you think your business might look like. Um, a real business plan is really going to be needed if you're, if you're going to chase some other funding. Um, a real business plan is probably needed, period. But this is a great first step. It doesn't replace a business plan, but it can help you start to augment one. Um, a real good business plan should have three sections. There's a, a marketing plan, a financial plan, and an operations plan. And as you've seen, as we flushed through, I'm going to go back one slide. Your marketing plan is pretty much the first four boxes. Your operation plan is pretty much the three over on the left. And the financial plan are boxes eight and five for your cost and revenue. Uh, if you take those, think of your canvas as three separate components and you start to develop a marketing plan, an operations plan, and a financial plan and expand on that and build a 20, 30, 60 page document, you're going to have a, a much more organized business plan at that point. But a business plan needs to incorporate all three of those main sections. And this is kind of your table of contents to get you started. It does not replace. Excellent. Thank you. And, and talking about business plans, if you're, you know, Tom mentioned, if you're going to a bank to get a loan, um, I'm going to put a plug in for the small business development centers. Again, mm -hmm. they have mm -hmm. a program that they use called Live Plan. Um, it's no cost to you if you work with them and there's no cost to work with the small business development centers, but by utilizing the business planning components of live plan, you can build that proper package. You can take your information from the business model canvas. You can build it out in live plan, and then you'll have a nice package that you can take to a lender with all the stuff the lender is going to look at for projections and financial numbers, um, cash flow, et cetera to then have a good package to ask for a loan. Um, one of the challenges that small businesses face when they 
get a rejection from the lender is that the business plan isn't well done or there's not a business plan or the financials are off. And so utilizing some of these no cost resources of quality resources, um, such as the ESBDC and using live plan with them can help uh, improve your ability to provide the proper package for a loan request. So um, great, uh, great information. And again, a great start, uh, great tool. Thanks, Tom. Um, love to talk about the business model canvas. I'm a firm believer in it. So that's why I like to share it. Um, I do see another question in there. We have just a couple minutes. Oh. Um, got answers. So um, with that, uh, don't have any other questions. Um, we did have one come up about uh, from Angela about developing partnerships and sponsorships. That's a whole mm -hmm. another discussion that would take uh, way more time than we have right now. But um, you can reach out to Tom or myself afterwards and we can try to schedule some time to talk about that separate or I'll even look at that as a potential upcoming boot camp session. I think that'd be a great um, idea. Was that around the, uh, the ninth box about the partnerships? Is it probably, yeah. Yep. Okay. So um, definitely can look at. Yep. Angela just up. popped in. Yes. In the chat box. So, okay. Yeah. Yep. So yeah, that's probably a whole nother, whole nother bootcamp day. I would suspect Angela. Yeah. But uh, with that, we'll go ahead and wrap up. Give everybody a few minutes before some of you jump into your next uh, 10 o'clock meeting. Um, but thank you for joining us today. Again, this is being recorded and the slide deck will be available uh, with the recording um, on our website later today. So again, um, if you wanna dive in deeper and look at some of those categories, you can see the slide deck, you can download that uh, once we get it posted on the website. So again, thanks for joining us and we hope you can join us next Tuesday for our next boot camp, and then on the 31st for our workshop. But until then, uh, again, have a great week and we'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Tom.